So those are the slides that I had for you today, but I would love to talk more about um, anything that's coming to mind, any questions uh, that folks might have based on those slides or, or other questions that you have that have been coming up in your uh, organizations about supporting trans and gender diverse young folks. So I'm gonna give people a couple minutes to throw some questions in the chat box. I wanna say, Caden, thank you so much. So far, this has been incredible. You've really successfully broken down a topic that I know a lot of aquatic professionals want to address, but they they either don't have a live experience personally to start from, or they just don't know where to start. So I've seen so many strategies in the PowerPoint slides, which are available, everybody, on the show notes for today. So you are welcome to go to the show notes for today's session, which I'll link in the chat box again, and download the slides. They've been graciously provided by our, our presenter today. I wanna make a couple of comments while you guys are thinking of your questions. Please put them in the chat box. Caden is available to answer them. I love what you were saying, Caden, about how much people, you know, these individuals, these communities, they have stopped participating in swimming. And I think that's a big thing that we're missing in aquatics. Too often there's a narrow mindedness of, well, they don't come to the pool anyway. Why should we accommodate? And we're preventing many individuals from experiencing the joy that we all have for swimming. So can you talk about what it was like for the participants in your trans swim nights to get back in the pool? What was like, I'm assuming they were thrilled. Yeah, for sure. I think that's such an important point that, that sometimes gets missed when we're having these conversations. And just like you're saying, you know, uh, you might look at the folks who are accessing your pool and say like, oh, I've, you know, I've never worked with any trans or gender diverse youth in this pool. And that's probably because either they're not coming to the pool or because they don't feel safe sharing their trans or gender diverse identity. Um, and that's the case for so many people. I know a, a lot of the trans and gender diverse youth that I work with have stopped participating really in any kind of recreational activities. Sports are often gender segregated. You know, all of these spaces are often really inaccessible to trans and gender diverse communities. And yeah, I think it's a really big deal to have these programs and have a space for people to be able to connect with each other. I think trans and gender diverse children and youth, um, you know, are always looking for ways to be able to connect with each other. And, and I think it's important to have any kind of social spaces for folks to connect. And I think that the swim night is um, such a great way of doing that because it gives people an opportunity to connect uh, and also have something to do. You know, it can be kind of awkward to be able to connect in yeah. like a, in a, just in a room sitting around a table uh, and not quite knowing what to say. Um, and I think because often people feel so uncomfortable or, or don't feel like they're able to access those you know, pools or other spaces like that. I think it also, you know, with that pool that we were able to partner with, people, you know, now know what that space looks like, know how it's set up, know that there is an all gender change room that's available. They know that the staff have gotten training. And so even when they're not coming to that particular event, uh, I think it still makes participating in swimming in general more accessible for people and gives people an opportunity to maybe try out different bathing suits when they're not sure what's going to make them feel the most comfortable. Or, um, yeah, I think it's it's so important for people. And I think people really appreciate it being able to have that space to come out. So I, I definitely agree with you on the bathing suits. And we're going to get to your question, Jennifer, in just a moment. I think bathing suits, we could have a whole sub-conversation about the fact that bathing suits are not even just gendered. They're, they're based on cultural assumptions, right? Mm -hmm. In some cultures, it's okay to wear a string bikini. In other cultures, acceptable to wear a burkini. And we bring our own biases and our own lived experiences. You know, myself as a white middle-class person, I just wear whatever, right? Other people don't have that experience or even access to bathing suits. So that's, I mean, for any program in any facility we should be looking critically at what bathing suits we require our participants to have because there's this mistaken notion that it's based on health regulations and i can tell you as a certified pool operator instructor a lot of that is just made up it's not real that's we need to look at the law or the requirements in our areas let's look at jennifer's question she asked in the moment how do you address kids that are confused when asked their preferred gender yeah, that's a really good question. I think that's actually a great learning opportunity to be able to have that conversation. And, you know, it doesn't need to be an hour long lecture like this was, but I think that um, often we're, it can be really scary to have those conversations with kids because we assume that they'll be confused or have questions or maybe we won't know how to answer those questions. But actually what I have found is that kids are often very open-minded and might be sort of curious, something might be new to them, uh, but often are really just want to know the answer, are kind of curious and you can give them an answer and they'll say, okay, and that's kind of the end of the conversation. So often I think it's um, less scary and dramatic than it feels like going into it. But often the conversations that I have with kids, I might say something like, you know, I might introduce my pronouns to start out with. So when I work with kids, I might say like, hi, my name's Kaden. 
I use they or he pronouns. Um, you know, I might explain a little bit about what pronouns are and why I'm saying that. Like, you know, often when we talk about people, we use words that are gendered. And so if I tell you that I have a friend and I refer to my friend as he, you might assume that my friend is a boy. And so it's important for us to use the pronouns that everyone feels the most comfortable with. And I'm telling you my pronouns so that you know what pronouns to use for me. And if anyone else wants to share their pronouns with the group or with me, you know, to give an opportunity to do that. I also think it's, um, it's not not ideal to force everyone to share their pronouns or to set up an expectation that everyone has to because there could be lots of different reasons why someone doesn't want to right so, you know someone maybe just has never heard of pronouns before and feels a little bit awkward and doesn't know what that means or maybe someone actually does identify as trans but isn't sure if they feel ready to share that yet i think especially when you're the only trans person in a space for people who don't identify as trans being asked their pronouns might feel like kind of no big deal and so if you go around in a circle and everyone shares their pronouns and Maybe there's like some giggling happening and people think it's maybe a little bit silly or not necessary. If you're the only person in that space who is trans or non-binary and who might be sharing pronouns that are different from what people expect, that can also be a really scary or, or uncomfortable situation to be in. So I think um, my go-to is usually to introduce my own pronouns as an opening and explain what that means and answer questions about that. And that also gives an opportunity for other people to share their pronouns if they want to. So um, I'll often do things like maybe a, a get to know you go around where uh, we also ask like a silly question. So it might be like, if you want to, you can share your name. If you want to, you can share your pronouns. And if you want to, you can answer the silly question. And that kind of breaks it up a little bit more rather than um, having a lot of emphasis on people like being required to state each of these things or give all of this information or feeling like they have to share their pronouns. Um, but it opens a space where people can share their pronouns if they want to, because I think it's also really scary if you want to share your pronouns so that people use the right ones, but no one's mentioned it. Uh, and maybe that kid then maybe doesn't know if you know what a pronoun is. Maybe you're going to be confused or okay. doesn't know what your reaction might be if they share that. And so I think it's about opening that space so that if someone does want to share their pronouns or, um, you know, maybe it's not even that day. Maybe it's like two months later when someone is thinking about this and is remembering that you talked about pronouns and maybe that means that you're a safe person to talk to. So, yeah, that's a really good question. I want to talk about bathing suits a little bit more, and then we're going to talk about structural space in the pool, because I know some people have questions about that. So, Caden, can you talk about what Ten Oaks did when you advertised, we're going to have this swim, if this is what it's going to cost, you can attend if you're comfortable. What was the messaging that you gave to your, um, to your community about bathing suits? Mm. Not the pool side, but in terms of, I recognize that individuals buying a bathing suit is expensive. Maybe they mm -hmm. are not ready to take a leap and buy a new bathing suit, or maybe they are not comfortable with their body. They want to wear t-shirts or clothing. What did you guys say about bathing suit requirements that you had maybe previously discussed with the city or the facility? Yeah, that's a really good question. So what we said in our all of our promotion and what, what we did for the event was that um, we said that everyone was required to wear bathing suit bottoms and that that could be any clean clothing. Um, so it could be like a traditional bathing suit, could be a pair of pants, a pair of shorts, uh, anything they wanted as long as it was like not obviously really dirty, basically. Um, and tops were optional but not required um, for anyone. So we didn't differentiate based on gender identity or um, any like physical characteristics. Anyone could wear a shirt or not wear a shirt if they wanted. Um, and that was also possible for us because it was a closed space, I think. Uh, there might be a little bit more negotiating of that if there's other folks who are in the pool at the same time. I'm not sure, you know, de depending on what jurisdiction you live in, what the laws are like, uh, and what sort of the options are. But that's what we did, and that worked really well. And um, people really appreciated that, particularly folks who um, maybe typically would be told that they would have to wear a shirt or some sort of top in the pool, uh, but who might identify as male and maybe like, you know, feel sort of comfortable and would feel more comfortable wearing just a pair of swim trunks or a pair of shorts. Uh, and not having to wear a shirt, even where maybe normally there would be an assumption that they should. Uh, that was actually really empowering for a lot of people and people really appreciated that. So yeah, that's what we did and it worked really well for us. Yeah, and I think that's a that's a really good navigation of the individual needs, but also looking at, you know, we do want people to wear something in the pool, but I think we need to be recognizing socioeconomic barriers to a lot of people accessing proper bathing suits as we call them mm -hmm. frankly again as a pool operator instructor if the fabric is clean if it's cotton if it's not you know there's a lot of basic intermediaries we can steps we can take between real bathing suits and preventing someone from using the pool and creating a damaging experience for them and them 
disliking ever going back to a pool because of our own set notions of what they should have in terms of equipment or clothing. Um, sure. I love that you also talked about staff training. I think that's a big one for all of our aquatic staff who are still on this webinar. If you are looking to do something at your facility, you must train your staff. So Caden, can you talk about, did they have volunteers from the city or how did they determine who would be uh, either mature enough or confident enough to work with your group during those private rentals? Yeah, it's a good question. I actually wasn't specifically involved in that part of the process, so I'm not sure exactly how it worked, but I think uh, we worked with a specific pool. So the city of Ottawa runs like many pools across the city. Uh, we worked with one specific pool and we chose that pool mostly because it's located downtown. So it's pretty accessible by public transit, like kind of equally distant from different parts of the city. Uh, and it's a relatively small pool. So, you know, if there's like a, a really, really large pool and you're having a private event or a closed event that only has five or six people, that might not feel worthwhile uh, to the city, uh, but their pool is pretty small and um, worked well for us in terms of the logistics. So I had, my understanding is that the folks who were working during those sessions were folks who would typically be working at that pool, so that sort of narrowed it down a little bit. Um, and then I think it was sort of just in collaboration with them. It was at the same time each month, so it was like the second Saturday at this for this one hour in the evening. So there wasn't really anything else going on in the community center at the time, and I think. Um, my understanding is that staff were kind of given an option if there was anyone who was really excited about it and wanted to be part of it. They were given that opportunity. At one point, we um, had a lifeguard who was working during that session who also identified as trans and it was like, that was really, really awesome. Um, but yeah, I think it was folks who were interested and wanted to be part of it or who were sort of open to that. Like people knew what they were getting into when, uh, when they were assigned to that shift. Um, and then we just made sure that, I think all of the folks in that uh, pool were, able to attend the training and, and had all that information. So uh, it didn't necessarily, you know, of course, it's not going to be the same person forever. People move and change jobs and things like that. But um, we were also able to repeat the training. So after a couple of years, if we know there's a lot of new staff and maybe new people who are going to be there during that time, we can do another training for those folks. Um, yeah. I think that's so important. I worked at the University of Toronto for seven years and we had a monthly or bi-monthly trans night. And it was so important. We didn't get the training that we should have gotten in hindsight, but at least the staff were, it was a volunteer basis and we were explicitly told what to expect and asked mm -hmm. if would, we could be mature and appropriate and that provide the customer with a positive experience. Mm -hmm. Because there's gonna be people in different uh, places in their education, their experience, what their, uh, what their comfort level is at work. And it's not a recipe for success for anybody putting the wrong people on the pool deck and then creating a scenario where the client or the rental group or the organization has a bad experience as well as the kids and the attendees. If they don't yeah. feel welcome, that's going to be so, so damaging. For sure. I think um, I think these are really good conversations to have because I think it's uh, often there's maybe an instinct to say like, of course, all of our staff should feel yeah. comfortable and confident working with trans and diverse folks, of course you know, everyone should feel welcome and included in the pool all the time. And I agree that's, you know, very, very true. Um, but also I think the the top priority is those kids and the experience that they have at the pool on that day. And so as much as like, I would love it if everyone was equally comfortable and confident working with transgender diverse folks and making sure that everyone feels comfortable. The reality is, is that if someone uh, doesn't want to be part of that program or, um, you know, doesn't want to work with transgender diverse youth, you know, there's maybe a, a bigger conversation to have with that person, but they definitely shouldn't be the one running that. For sure. And I think it's also going to be too it, administratively. Let's talk a little bit about the pool space, Caden. Can you describe, it's a smaller pool, I'm assuming, older pool. And so there was, what was it like in terms of blocking off windows or was it private? Was that one of the reasons you also selected that pool so that people couldn't, you know, look at the rental? It was exclusive to your group? Yeah, so this pool worked really well for our needs. So it was a pretty small pool and it was actually in the basement of the community center. So it's a small community center. I think there's like a basement, a main floor and an upstairs and there's a bunch of different rooms that can be rented for different uh, programs. The pool's in the basement and it's the only thing in the basement. So no one's really going downstairs unless they're going to the pool. Uh, and there's a small lobby area. So you'd come down the stairs and we would have our posters up saying like, this is the event that's happening right now. So folks knew you know, that we were there and we had 10 Oaks staff who were there each time. So I would get there a little bit before the event started and I would be there to greet people as they came in and make sure that that's what they were there for and they weren't just coming to come swimming and maybe didn't know. Mm -hmm. um, and to do that, I would just say like, hey, are you here for our trans children swim night? And they would say yes and they would do it. Because we also don't necessarily, you know, 
we don't know by looking at someone that they identify as trans, we don't want to police people's identities or tell them that they can or can't be there. Uh, but we do want to make sure that people know that that's the event that's happening and can say like, yep, that's why I'm here. Um, so there was like a little counter there and then there was typically there would be a, a male and female change room and then an accessible all gender change room. Uh, and we just put posters over the signs on the doors that said all gender and that would cover the, the male or female sign during the time that we were there and then we could take them down when we were not there. Um, yeah. I think that's so important to consider any facilities that are interested in starting a program like this. And we'll get, uh, we've still got a time for a few more questions. So think about those and add them to the chat box. But I will say having worked at a facility that also tried to offer either women's only swim or men's only swim or a trans swim program, you need to look at your windows, your doors and creating that private environment. Because I've seen a lot of scary posts in Facebook groups for our aquatic professionals that talk about things like, well, they rented the pool, we don't have to do anything for them, we don't have to set up the space. You set up the space for your swim teams, you set up the space for your swimming lessons. If you are trying to do outreach and increase participation in your programs by involving a trans community or different groups, you need to really think about how that space is going to be used and how they're going to feel most comfortable. And some pools, it's not going to be possible to create that privacy. Other pools, you're going to have to create, you know, barriers, devices, whatever that looks like. But I know for the swims that I've worked, that's been a significant component for the individuals to feel comfortable that they're not going to, there's nobody going to barge in, there's reasonable administrative steps we can take as management to make it a safe space. Definitely. Um, Oh, I totally lost my train of thought. So we've talked structural space. We've talked about, oh, where would you start? So you've given us a lot of great strategies. Let's say I'm at a pool anywhere in North America and I'm thinking, yes, we're not doing enough. My change rooms are mislabeled. I don't have a great space. I don't have a community outreach person. We've so much we need to do to improve. Where would you start if you had to pick like one or two small places for an aquatics professional to start? Yeah, that's a really good good question. I think, uh, I mean, first of all, I'm sure it depends on what your role is and how much say you have uh, in the organization. I think, you know, regardless of what your role is, all of those tips that we talked about in terms of individual things that you can do, um, you can kind of just start doing. I don't think that there's, you know, um, doesn't necessarily need to even involve other people in your organization. But I do think that having those conversations with people above you, potentially whatever role you're in, I think that involving more people who have more decision-making power and having those conversations and just sharing information, even something as simple as saying like, hey, I attended this webinar, here are the slides that are posted online, you know, that information is available to people. And just starting a conversation in your organization about what things might be possible in your organization, what things are easy, what things maybe are something that take a little bit more planning. Um, and there's uh, a lot of variety there. So, you know, changing the signs on a change room maybe is something that doesn't require too much planning, or maybe it does depending on the infrastructure of the, the space that you're in. Other things like setting up a new program maybe take more planning, but it's maybe something that could be the beginning of a conversation about what that would look like. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I think don't get overwhelmed. I think that's a yeah. big thing, right? We we're such visionaries in aquatics. We want to do everything perfectly right out of the gate. But honestly, this is going to be, um, you know, a big project potentially. Like you've said, Caden, a lot of organizations, they may be slow to change. They may be big. You might need a lot of approvals. But even like you said, the signs, you may not be able to get new plastic signs right this week, but you can laminate some paper right? You, what steps can you take immediately, small steps, and then kind of navigate bigger steps, maybe six months from now, maybe next shutdown, maybe, you know, other, other things like that. For sure. I guess the other thing that comes to mind is looking for other organizations in your community that you might be able to partner with. So particularly if you're interested in doing something like uh, a trans swim program, or if you're maybe wanting to do some training for your staff team, um, there is most likely, regardless of where you're located, folks who are nearby enough who might be interested in and available to do some of that work with you. And so if you're thinking about offering a specific trans swim program, I would definitely recommend getting in touch with an organization in your community that already works with 2SLGBTQ plus communities and trans and diverse youth, particularly if it's run by those communities. So the Ten Oaks Project is we're really specifically run by 2SLGBTQ plus communities and for 2SLGBTQ plus communities. And that's really important to us because it builds a lot of trust with our community. You know, we're already connected with our communities. We know, you know, what's needed and, and how to connect. Um, and so I think if there's organizations in the area that you're able to partner with, either on specific programs or training, or maybe to get 
you know, a local perspective on what's going really well in your, your agency and what maybe uh, you could be doing even better. I think that that's a good place to start as well. Okay, well, I don't see any other questions in the chat box. So I wanna say a big thank you to Caden of the Ten Oaks Project. Their, their organization is linked in the chat box, as well as Kimani, who was here filling in for Hannah. Hannah, hope she gets well soon. Uh, thank you so much for being here today. We'll say goodbye to Caden. I'm gonna do a little bit of an introduction to kind of the next couple sessions coming up this week. So Caden, you're welcome to turn off your microphone and camera, and I'm just gonna give everyone a, a rundown kind of what's happening the rest of this week. Awesome, thanks for having me, Katie. Yeah, thanks so much. All right, so for those of you who are still here, just kind of an update what's happening the rest of this week. So thank you so much to coming out to this first session. It is my goal to have the recording up on YouTube as well as the updated show notes in one within one week. It's not going to be every second day like last year. I do need a little bit of work-life balance. So within one week, you can keep an eye on the show notes for the web recording on YouTube as well as a lot of resources that all of you have shared in the chat box as well as any additional resources that we want to include on the show notes. So coming up tomorrow, Tuesday, March 2nd, I wanna make sure that everybody knows that every Tuesday night in March, we do have free socials on Zoom. These are sponsored by Aqua Essence Swim Academy. Roshona's here in the chat box. Super excited that Roshona and her staff are going to be doing games and prizes in a meeting uh, Zoom feature where there's breakout rooms, we can get to know each other, and it's not just, you know, me and the presenter on the webinar. So please feel free to register for those. They're free, but we do like to know how many people are coming so we can plan the activities accordingly. Coming up on Wednesday, I am super excited about all of our presenters, but I'm particularly excited that on Wednesday this week, we are going to have Kathleen Forrestell. She is from the Canadian National Institute for the Blind. She is partially sighted. She is blind. I'm learning the language. Blind is, is not the right language. She will be joining us to talk about her lived experience as a partially sighted person, including a Paralympic athlete. She used to go downhill skiing. Uh, she was at the Olympics. And she is now an advocate for partially sighted individuals in terms of access. And she's going to be talking about how she has stopped going to public pools because her lived experience has not always been positive based on her guide dog being sent off the pool deck and what are some strategies so that we can better understand uh, different abilities that are not always visible. So every person has different abilities and often if we don't see a white cane or we don't see a guide dog or we don't see a wheelchair, we're not as accommodating as an aquatic facility as we could be. Please note that the session on Wednesday will be on Zoom as a webinar, so it will have the same security features as Click Meeting. You will not be visible as a meeting, but for her needs as a presenter, this platform is not accessible to a partially sighted person. So please ensure you pre-register. That session is coming up on Wednesday this week. Thursday night, I'm going to be doing a Facebook Live. So if you don't follow us on Facebook, you can hop on over Thursday night. I will be doing a Facebook Live with Dave Ling. He is the head swim coach of the Newmarket uh, Stingrays Swim Club in Ontario. And we're going to be having a, t a conversation about what does competitive swimming look like in the last year. I know a lot of us aquatic professionals, we don't always have the best relationships with our competitive swimmers. And looking at how he has built those conversations with aquatic staff, facility managers, and then also giving us as aquatic professionals some perspective and some empathy towards those athletes that have had their dreams either adjusted or shattered, especially with all of the the changes we've had in the last year with swim meets, comp competitions, the Olympics. And it's gonna be more of a casual conversation on Facebook Lives. So you can join us for that if you're interested in hearing more from him. He is a great guy. I worked with him at the University of Toronto. I was in school with his wife. And so really looking forward to chatting with him about that. And then coming up on Friday, we have a session on water slides. And those of you at smaller facilities, please do feel free to also come. This is not about, you know, big water parks, big aquatic facilities. This is really looking in greater detail about water slides. 
And I know for myself in talking with our presenter, Ryan Jones, who is based near me in Calgary, I never realized how much variety there is to water slides and how they can be part of our programming and how they can be part of our revenue to draw people to the facility. Whether it's a teeny tiny little, you know, $1,000 water slide or a half million dollar water slide, we're not talking about something that's outside of reach. We're talking about just how those slides are part of what we offer as an aquatic facility. So this is the last call for questions, comments, concerns. I'm really happy that everybody was able to join us today. I so appreciate your willingness to join me in 2021 to come back for these webinars. I know you have a lot of places you can be, a lot of different opportunities for virtual events to attend. So I thank you so much for attending today. If you are interested in supporting the webinars, we do have some merch available for purchase this year. We don't take sponsorship and we don't solicit branding from the manufacturers because we do know that that is important to a lot of you to have a transparent educational opportunity that is not overly branded or overly pushy. So if you have the opportunity to buy some small items, we ship them anywhere in the world, the shipping is included. And a lot of them are made here in Alberta, made in Canada. So I'm trying to think anything else I wanted to say. It's uh, today is Monday, March 1st. So this was our first pool aid webinar. And the topic that we had today, I was gonna say, was safety in the pool beyond the head count, creating safer spaces in the water for trans communities. And we had Caden Seaburn here from the 10 Oaks Project in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. Thank you so much to everyone who was here. You can look for updated show notes later this week. You can register for upcoming events. You can share with your friends. Uh, follow us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, all of the places. <laughs> you know where to find me. And yeah, have a great rest of your Monday.